the March NSDA public forum topic will be resolved. The United States should withdraw its military presence from Okinawa. To some extent, this l overlaps a little bit with a past high school policy topic and the current college policy topic. So we'll talk about the commonalities between those a little down the road. First, I want to talk about the wording, the background, and some of the major framing debates that are going to be important when looking at this topic. So, first off, withdraw probably means to take away, not to relocate within. Withdrawal from Okinawa is probably a prerequisite from withdrawal from Japan, but is not synonymous with withdrawal from Japan. One of the things that will decide which sides get access to which contentions on this topic is whether or not Pro can pick where troops go after they leave Okinawa, and whether Khan can do the same. Does withdrawal mean they have to do, go back to the U.S.? Could they simply be redeployed elsewhere? Can Khan claim benefits from freeing these troops up? All of those kind of come down to what withdraw actually means. <coughs> the next question is just what do we mean by military presence? The resolution does not say all military presence, but teams can choose to infer that the resolution means a mass noun, and it also doesn't say some military presence. So neither side has a clearly, unequivocally correct wording of the resolution there, but both sides can take a look at it and say, okay, here is why I think that we should say all, or we should say most. And from that, really, it's just going to be a framing question of which of these leads to better debate, which of these is more in the spirit of what we think the topic ought to be about, and why. I guess the next question is, what is the military presence in Okinawa? And right now, it's about 28,000 troops, which is about two-thirds of the total U.S. military personnel in Japan, and about three-quarters of the total U.S. bases in Japan, which I think is around 84, 85 right now. <coughs> so... It's a pretty large component of the U.S. presence there, but by no means the totality of it. The central base, the headquarters, is still Yokota Air Force Base near Tokyo. You could argue that the most important base is still Sasebo Naval Station, which is near Nagasaki. But really, the bulk, the plurality of any armed service that the U.S. has a presence with in Japan is going to rely on Okinawa to be able to do what it does in the status quo. Now, what the forces are doing there and what their goals there are is also certainly very up for debate, but before that I want to talk about what difference it makes when we're focusing on Okinawa rather than Japan as a whole. Now, Okinawa is kind of the southernmost prefecture of Japan, but there's also an impression among some Japanese and some Okinawans that Okinawa is not really Japan. It's a lot farther away from Japan than all of the other major islands. It was conquered more recently than other parts of Japan, and it never returned to its original rule. Part of that is because it joined with Japan a long time before World War II, as opposed to more recent conquests that went back to previous owners or new owners after the war ended. Part of it is because the U.S. established a pretty large foothold there in the Battle of Okinawa in 1945. Part of it is just because when you go ahead and look at where Okinawa is, how much it feels like a part of the country as a whole, how much voice it has in the country as a whole, and how much the country wants it, how much it wants the country. You'll often see analogies comparing it to Puerto Rico in the U.S. or comparing it to Texas in the U.S. It's not really the lone star state of Japan. There's not really nearly as much talk about being a separate country or just talk about secession at all. But you do definitely see the idea in some Japanese political discourse that Okinawa is less Japanese than Japan proper. 
And that creates a situation where even though U.S. presence in Japan is fairly popular among the Japanese as a whole, it is substantially less popular among Okinawans. If there were a vote today by Okinawans on the future of U.S. bases in Okinawa, there would be many fewer or no U.S. bases in Okinawa. But it's really not Okinawa's decision. That said, political climates have shifted recently, and that changes a couple things. So, a while back, Shinzo Abe became Prime Minister of Japan. Now, he's also the head of the Liberal Democratic Party, which, unlike what the name suggests to Americans, is a fairly pro-military, right-wing, nationalist party. That alone doesn't do too much, though he has been an advocate for Japan's remilitarization, which we will also get to later. However, Okinawa's new mayor, Takeshi Onaga, Onaga, Takeshi Onaga, has also come out as an opponent of U.S. bases there, and that was one of the wedge issues that took him to victory in the recent election. So we have a prime minister of Japan who wants Japan to be less reliant on U.S. bases, and we have a mayor of Okinawa who wants fewer U.S. bases in Okinawa, so that kind of sets things up for the potential for a larger change. Now, there was a decent reduction in 2013-2014. The U.S. went ahead with plans to send about 10,000 personnel away from one of the larger bases in Okinawa and redeploy them back to Guam and other bases in the South Pacific. But the question now is, A, was that a good idea? B, will it be fully implemented? C, is it enough? <coughs> I'm sorry, I've been putting off making this video for a while in the hopes that my voice would get better and I would get less sick, but did not want to delay any longer. So, let's go ahead and take a look at why the U.S. troops are in Japan in the first place. U.S. troops went to Japan at the end of World War II as a part of Japan's practically unconditional surrender. At that point... The U.S. wanted to maintain a foothold there, and a lot of the U.S.'s allies and Japan's former colonies had a pretty strong interest in Japan not becoming a military power ever again. As a result, the new constitution of Japan post-World War II specifically said that Japan could not have an offensive military. They could have small self-defense forces, but no offensive military. And what that sets up is a situation where Japan is relying on the U.S. to functionally be its military. This became important during the Korean War, during the Vietnam War, during the Cold War in general, because the deterrent to North Korea, the deterrent to China, the deterrent to the USSR during those years was not Japanese self-defense forces themselves, it was the U.S. military stationed there. Whether the deterrent is still necessary or still effective is another question that both teams will want to try to answer in their own ways. That said, U.S. forces in Japan are the largest concentration of U.S. forces in that area and are largely seen as key to power projection throughout East Asia throughout the Pacific. And this isn't just in terms of dealing with military conflicts, this is in terms of dealing with lots of other smaller issues as well. So for instance, the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit is headquartered in Okinawa. These days it's typically referred to as a Marine Contingency Force, but it's the same troops doing the same things. And generally speaking, they've been called out a lot not for military action, which they really haven't seen since they got brought into Fallujah during the Iraq surge, but they've been called out to deal with cyclones, earthquakes, mudslides, typhoons, tidal waves throughout Myanmar, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Sumatra. About two years ago, when the Jindo Island ferry sank going back to South Korea, it wasn't U.S. forces in Korea who were deployed to deal with that, it was U.S. forces from Okinawa. Similarly, when the tsunami and the earthquake hit Japan and caused the various troubles with meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi, 
That created a situation which was also responded to by the 31st MEU first and foremost. So their key to American power projection in the region, not so much in a purely military sense, but also in terms of disaster relief, in terms of soft power, the recent earthquake near Nepal is also a place where fast deploying helicopters from Okinawa made a huge difference. So the troops are not just there to fight against an invasion from China or North Korea or anything like that. They also do serve actual roles that rely on their current location. Now, if the troops were not there, the issue becomes what happens? Who fills that vacuum? Does the U.S. just repurpose troops in South Korea, repurpose troops in Guam, repurpose troops in mainland Japan to do the same things? Does it give that up? Are the troops there enough to still act as a deterrent? Is a deterrent needed? It's not like the U.S. has enough troops in Japan that if a neighboring country, even North Korea, were to attack Japan, they would necessarily be able to fend them off. It's more an issue of if you want to attack Japan or Okinawa, there are enough U.S. installations and troops scattered around that you can't do so without attacking the U.S. as well. So it's pretty much impossible in the status quo to start a war with Japan without starting a war with the U.S. in the process. So that provides that kind of protection, where the protection relies on a certain number of troops is, again, a different question. <coughs> so, when you're looking at these troops, there's also questions that have been raised about, is location as important in the 21st century? Can they be deployed from farther away? Do carrier groups mean bases like this are slightly less important as long as they still have the dry docks at Nagasaki? Is the ability to embed them there more worthwhile than just using them as human shields? Does it just make us more vulnerable to a first strike if somebody were to attack? Does it put troops more in harm's way? This is often accompanied by a Pearl Harbor analogy, which is kind of ironic in this situation. But the point still stands. Rand Corporation has done studies suggesting that if China and the U.S. were to come to conflict, U.S. troops in Japan would be gone before they realized the war was going on. So that's certainly another st strategic consideration as well, that being too far forward deployed can be a problem. Beyond that, though, there's questions that don't just affect the U.S. Remember, the topic does not ask if this is in the best interests of the United States. The topic asks what should be done. So even though the United States is the actor, it is not the sole agent from whom this resolution should be considered. It is not necessarily all impacts must be framed around how they affect the U.S., if a team proves that something is slightly harmful on net to the U.S., but beneficial on balance overall to all countries involved, that could still be a reason that the U.S. should do it. Because again, the topic is not necessarily solely a question of American national interests, though obviously as it is America's military, there is some say that America has in this. So when we're looking at this, what we want to look at is how is this going to affect the rest of the region. And even though South Korea and Japan are nominally allies, it is a region with long memories. There are politicians in power in China, in South Korea, whose parents were killed by Japanese imperial forces. There are people who have bad memories of what happened the last time Japan was militarized, and when Japanese prison camps and specialized units like Unit 731, which basically made Dr. Mengele look like Florence Nightingale, were given free reign over Manchuria, over China, over Southeast Asia in general. So there are a lot of people who do not want to see Japan demilitarize. And that kind of takes us to a larger issue on this topic, which is that a lot of links are links of perception rather than links of reality. And what I mean by that 
is it doesn't matter whether Japan is actually a threat. It matters whether other countries' leaders perceive Japan to be a threat. It doesn't matter whether a U.S. withdrawal leaves Okinawa vulnerable to North Korea becoming aggressive. It matters if Kim Jong-un believes that it does. It doesn't matter if the U.S. closing base is down in Okinawa means that the U.S. is unwilling to fight over constructed islands in the South China Sea and is basically saying, do whatever you want with the region to China. It matters whether the Chinese party thinks it does. So at that point, we are in a situation where most links aren't necessarily based off of what people's actual true intentions or true consequences will be. You're talking about a lot of different actors with their own political agendas and their own militaries who can make their perceptions into self-fulfilling prophecies. And that's important to keep in mind as you are constructing scenarios, as you are constructing impact defense, as you are picking apart internal link chains, that perception in many cases matters as much as reality does here. The other thing to keep in mind is just the effect on Okinawa itself. Now, these aren't necessarily going to be the biggest impacts in terms of magnitude, but they're impacts that are ongoing, so time frame probability become much easier to weigh for them. Generally speaking, the perception of U.S. troops in Okinawa hit a low point in 1995. It has gone up slightly since then, but much like a lot of other places the U.S. base is deployed, the troops are seen as violent, they are seen as threats to the local population, they are seen as prone to going out and drinking and starting trouble, they are seen as having very hazy notions as to what actually constitutes consent from the locals, and again, even if the actual rate of crimes committed is lower than the local Okinawan population, it is a link of perception that can matter here in terms of how people react and what this actually means for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Beyond that, there are also environmental concerns, there are also economic concerns. Many Okinawans see it as a choice between U.S. GIs and Chinese tourists, and that one of the two is going to be all over their island regardless. Some prefer one, some prefer the other, some really prefer neither, but would rather stick with what they know than what they don't. That said, when you're looking at the effects on Okinawa, you want to make sure to explain that far-fetched hypothetical scenarios are less important than what is actually going on, especially when there is a far-fetched hypothetical counterfactual that impacts turns any given scenario. Japan remilitarization was almost the March topic. It could be a debate in and of itself whether it is good or whether it is bad. If both sides agree that a withdrawal from Okinawa would accelerate Japanese remilitarization, given that Abe wants it, given that he's starting to get the political support for it, the question becomes, what would East Asia look like at that point in time? Would it be a more stable or less stable place? Would it help or hurt alliances between the US and South Korea, Japan and South Korea, South Korea and China, the US and Japan, any kind of trilateral alliances that could be set up there could be affected by this as well. Again, based largely off of impacts of perception. <coughs> Just watch the day after I make this, I'll f will finally be the day I get better from whatever plague they had going around at the round robin. So... Overall, you can find evidence for this topic in the news fairly easily. You can also find it in 2010-2011 high school policy topic. I've included a link to that in the description just below the like button. Aside from that, you can also find it in the 2015-2016 college policy topic. The link for that will be there as well. Obviously, the college topic is going to be more recent, but both have their own distinct values. The high school policy topic specifically mentions Japan in the topic. The college topic does not. It lists regions of the world. The high school policy topic organizes things by argument, so you can just click on the link, scroll down, click on Japan, and see all of the arguments for and against relating to Japan. 
the high school policy, sorry, the college policy open case list is organized more by school running arguments. And many schools aren't even talking about Japan at all on this topic. Those aren't necessarily talking about Okinawa. If they are talking about Okinawa, they may be talking about it in a way that doesn't really have to do with withdrawal. So make sure that the arguments there are actually pertinent. They are more recent, but at the same time, a lot of them are still using many of the same cards as the high school topic and won't necessarily apply themselves as well to this topic or this format. If you choose to go through the college wiki, there are teams that are running Okinawa-specific arguments from Kentucky, from Northwestern, from Houston, and from UC Berkeley, all of which have evidence that could be useful here. I'm sure there are many others as well, but those are the ones that stood out to me. Overall, when you're looking at this topic, it's going to be, even more so than most topics, about convincing the judge what the world of the pro and the world of the con would look like after the judge votes either way. That your vision is more accurate than your opponent's vision, that your predictions are more accurate than your opponent's predictions, that overall you are painting a more vivid and more believable picture of what a world without U.S. bases would look like or what the world will happen to look like if U.S. bases continue. And this can be a question of disaster relief, this can be a question of local unrest, this can be a question of human rights, this can be a question of environmental destruction, this can be a question of Japanese militarization, this can be a question of the Asia pivot, this can be a question of where these troops end up getting redeployed to, this could be a question of counterbalancing, this could be a question of Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, this could be a question of alliances through Vietnam. There are many, many things that can go into this topic. The important thing is to know why you have picked the ones that you choose to use in your case. Every impact you choose to include in your constructive should be there because you have an easy explanation that you could give in summary or final focus about why it is the most important area of this topic, the one with the most likely, most immediate, most directly related consequences. If you can do that, you will be fine. It sounds like a very narrow topic, but it is a fairly broad topic. Teams that can weigh intelligently will have a huge edge not only in case writing, but also in the actual debates themselves. If you have other questions about specific parts of the topic, any arguments I mentioned, anything you find in the wikis that you're not sure about what it means or how to use it, feel free to leave a comment. I will try to answer either in the comments or if there are enough questions in a follow-up video, but I don't want to have this one drag on too long, even if about half of it is coughing so far. Good luck.